Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and ending corporate domination. Our guest today is attorney Dan Meek. Dan is known for his work on suing utilities to protect consumers and for using the initiative process to advance democracy by, among other things, limiting political campaign contributions. Dan is the legal advisor to the Oregon Progressive Party. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, David. Yeah, it's been a little while since you've been on. It's been a little while since your show has been on. Well, it's true. Although I've been doing this now since January, oh, so right. I, I have a few shows under the belt. So, so what's uh, what's new on campaign finance reform in? Um, well, let, let's start with the county because we we some things have been happening. Well, uh, let's start. Actually, I would like to start statewide for just a second, and start with a the first delightful illustration, and ask your viewers to take a quiz. And the question is, what are the worst states for political finance regulation for, for preventing or curing corruption? And this is the result of a study by the State Integrity Pr Investigation of the Center for Public Integrity and Public Radio International. They put out their last report on this in November of 2015. They seem to be doing, uh, you know, they update the report every, every three years or so. So here's the choices, worst states political finance regulation. This means you know, regulating contributions, expenditures, uh, disclosing where the money is coming from, so you know who's, mm -hmm. who's funding the candidates. So you have three choices of the worst states. Choice number one, New Jersey and Alabama. Sounds pretty promising. How about number two, Texas and Louisiana? Got to be there. Got to be pretty, probably pretty bad. What about number three, Mississippi and Oregon? Oregon shouldn't even be on the list, should how could it? That, how could Oregon be anywhere near one of the worst states in political finance? It's, it's just you know mm -hmm. impossible. Yeah. So the next um, illustration indicates the answer, and the answer is the worst states in political finance regulation are Mississippi and Oregon. Oregon, you know, barely beat Mississippi. So we're number wow. 49 in wow. when it comes to campaign finance reform. Yeah, Oregon doesn't really have a lot of bragging rights on, on so many issues anymore, but here's, here we can brag about <laughs> this. Right. We can brag that we're better than Mississippi, but that's all. Right. Yeah. Notice that uh, New Jersey and New Jersey is not bad at all, and, and Louis number 14, mm -hmm. and Louisiana isn't bad at all either. So mm -hmm. the, um, the reputation of yeah. various states uh, as being clean or corrupt doesn't hold up to yeah. to scrutiny. Yeah, I'm but, uh, but Alabama and Texas, well, both better than Oregon. Both considerably better than Oregon. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of the the story of uh, Tom Tom Delay. Remember Tom Delay, the yep. mm -hmm. uh, the speak the majority leader in, in the, House the, the House of Representatives. He was uh, indicted and and convicted uh, a few years ago for. Um, uh, essentially money laundering in Texas. What he did is that he arranged for corporations to provide money to fund the campaigns of various candidates for the Texas legislature. And he, you know, he raised like, like, like something like, he did this with about $150,000. And so he was convicted of, of, uh, of felonies for doing that. Of course, in Oregon, that happens every day, right? And, because and, there's no and, law against uh, it. There's no law against it. And and Tom, if Tom Delay did that in Oregon, as far as providing corporate funding for um, legislative candidates in the amounts that he did, he wouldn't even be noticed because it's so small. Mm -hmm. I mean, 120, 150 thousand dollars is absolutely nothing in in Oregon, in Oregon. legislative races, as, as we'll see in a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to, to broaden, be, 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 before before you go on, you said expenditures. Now I know what expenditures are, right. but I will bet that most people in our audience don't know the difference between a contribution and expenditure. Well, a contribution uh, in political finance law is when a a candidate's campaign receives money from any, basically any source, a donation from an individual or a corporation or a nonprofit corporation or, or anything. That's a contribution. And then the candidate's campaign get, gets to decide how to spend the money. Now, expenditures really refers to two different things. Well, how the candidate's campaign spends the money, and that is an expenditure. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the flip side of the contribution, contributions and expenditures. But there's another category as well called independent expenditures. And that's when a, a person or entity 
takes uh, money and directly communicates with voters by means of you know, TV ads or radio ads or billboards or whatever. They do their own, um, their own ads and bypass the campaign. They don't contribute to the candidate, but nevertheless, they're either supporting the candidate or opposing a candidate by doing their own advertising. Right, and, and supposedly they're doing all of that independent of the, can, of the, can, of the candidate. That's the, that's the theory, the that's theory, the myth. The yes. theory, right, yeah. Um, and these days, like on the presidential level, most of the presidential campaigns uh, this time around were independent expenditures. Mm -hmm. That is just, you know, supposedly without any, any cooperation mm -hmm. of, the, of the candidates. Right. Yeah. Um, so if we broaden out the, the state integrity investigation a little bit, uh, in the third um, illustration, we see that Oregon not only got an F in political financing, which is the second thing listed, they also got Fs in public access to information, executive accountability, procurement, lobbying disclosure, and ethics enforcement agencies. They did earn a, 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 a nice D minus in legislative accountability, which, is, which was the best grade. Mm -hmm. Well, I... <laughs> You, you got to start somewhere, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we can talk a little bit later about what's going on at the legislature, what mm -hmm. legislative accountability uh, really means. Mm -hmm. So um, in order to start countering this, uh, you and I and a bunch of other people in, in Multnomah County uh, last year managed to get onto the ballot, uh, Measure 26184, um, the uh, amendment to the, to the Multnomah County Charter, which is kind of like the Constitution of Multnomah County. And it, um, it passed in November, last November, by a vote of 89%. 89% yes. Mm -hmm. um, Phenomenal rate. I mean, it's more votes, almost unheard of. Un well, the most votes ever on a, on a county measure. Oh, okay. Never, mm -hmm. never have there been this many yeah. votes on a county measure. So um, what does it do? Well, it prohibits contributions by corporations and other entities to candidate campaigns. It limits any candidate in for Multnomah County office to receiving any more than $500 from any individual or, or political committee. It provides for the, the recognition of small donor committees, which are committees that can uh, accept only contributions from individuals and only in amounts of $100 or less per individual per year. Um, and if, you, if, if that's your source of funding, then under the Multnomah County Charter Amendment, um, the committee can spend the money however it wants because that's that is, I think, a small d democracy. You're, you're, you're accumulating or funds from a lot of, small funds from a lot of people and then using it to, uh, um, to promote the candidate, candidate of your choice. And an important provision, the last one there, it requires that the, the five largest true original sources of funds be prominently disclosed on all political advertisements. Mm -hmm. And um, this is uh, primarily a a fail-safe kind of provision. Um, the measure also um, limits the amount that anyone or any corporation or entity can spend on independent expenditures to a couple thousand dollars. And of course, that's what um, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down, that kind of a limit in citizens, the Citizens United case in 2010 on a five to four decision. Um, so when we drafted this measure uh, back a year ago, um, of course, we were uh, hoping that the Citizens United decision would soon be going away because Antonin Scalia had died. He was <coughs> part of the five to four majority. And it looked at that time that, that there would be a, you know, Hillary Clinton would win the presidency and she had said that she would only appoint Supreme Court justices uh, who would overturn Citizens United. That mm -hmm. would be her litmus test mm -hmm. for a Supreme Court justice. And so, uh, very confident that Citizens United was going to be a thing of the past, no problem. <laughs> we could limit or ban totally independent expenditures. Independent expenditures were banned on the federal level, in all federal uh, races, uh, in 2003 in McCain, mm. the Main, McCain Feingold Act. Um, and that ban was upheld in 2005 by the Supreme Court. It was, it was only after the Bush appointees got to the Supreme Court that they changed that decision. With the Citizens United decision. Citizens United in, right. in uh, 2010. 2010. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were thinking, well, we can ban independent, we, can, we can limit independent expenditures, we can you know, do what's right. But then Trump wins and appoints Gorsuch to the court, who of course will vote with the 
with the other four mm -hmm. uh, Citizens United folks. And so this fail-safe provision becomes, becomes quite important because um, if there are independent, now if there are independent expenditures in Multnomah County races, each ad that they fund has to identify the five largest true original sources of the money. How does that get determined? How, how do you know who the true, true sources are? Well, the, you are required to, uh, all political advertising is required to disclose where its money comes from. And today in Oregon, it's sometimes, under the Oregon system, it's sometimes difficult to determine where the money actually comes from. If you look, if you look at the, the reporting system in Oregon, the, the reporting system even on the county level is administered by the state. It's called the Orstar system. And if, if you look at most candidate, uh, you know, big money candidate races, um, some of the contributions, you can certainly identify where they come from. They come from, you know, Monsanto, Dow Chemical, DuPont, you know, the, the teachers union, the, the SEIU, whatever. Mm -hmm. But some of them you can't. Some of, many of the contributions to candidate campaigns are made by other political committees. So you'll see Future PAC, uh, Oregonians for Food and Shelter, um, the that Oregon, sounds good. That sounds that sounds great. Um, you, you know the Oregon Family Farm Association. All sorts. Of, you know they sound great. So what you have to do then is you have to look up on Orstar where their money came from. So the example of Oregonians for Food and Shelter, for example, that sounds like a very um, you know uh, charitable organization. So you look it up and you find out that their money comes from um, primarily from Monsanto Corporation, Dupont Corporation. Dow Chemical, it's chemical companies, agribusiness companies, Cargill, etc. So that doesn't sound quite so friendly. No, and it's even less friendly when you find out, when you try. Sometimes you find out that there's a whole chain of organizations with very nice sounding names that you have to go through before you finally find out where the money originally originally came from. And even then, you can't always find out because sometimes the money originally comes from a nonprofit corporation. <laughs> Okay. That has a nice name and doesn't disclose its donors. Uh -huh. So okay. that's why. So they, they potentially can bury over. Oh, they can bury bear. over and, uh, and right. over and over again. So that's why the Multnomah County measures that the five largest true original sources it requires that you uncover all of these phony names and you get to the original sources like they like they did in California with Chevron. Mm -hmm. Quick example. Uh, Chevron tried to take over the city government of Richmond, California in 2014 to prevent them from regulating their large refinery. Spent $3 million on four candidates for the city council and mayorship. Uh, spent $300 per voter on it. Outspent their opponents by 50 to 1. And, however, California had a law that said that political ads have to identify their largest donors. And so every, all of their ads and billboards flyers and postcards had to say on it Chevron, you know, funded by Chevron Inc. And all of their candidates overwhelmingly lost. So mm -hmm. it does it does make a difference to know where the money is coming from and that's that's what this provision is about. Okay. All right, great. So what we want to do is extend this to the state level. The money in politics is even is a far worse problem on the, on the state level. Uh, this chart shows that how spending on uh, races for the state legislature has increased by a factor of 10 since 1996, it's up to, to uh, just about $30 million a year. The next chart indicates a similar. So those, those are House and Senate races? House and Senate races okay. together. Mm -hmm. And that's really a little bit misleading because um, m fewer and fewer Oregon legislative races are contestable or contested. Um, as redistricting is done every 10 years, it turns out that more seats are, are very safe in the sense that either that the electorate in the district is either overwhelmingly Democratic or overwhelmingly Republican. And so of the 60 seats in the Oregon legislature that are up every two years, only about 10 are ever considered to be contestable or contested. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, very safe, um, very little money is spent in those races. So when you see that the, the amount of money is going up, that it's going way up when it comes to individual races as the, and we have a table here saying on you know, legislative campaigns spend money, in 2014, the top 10 races for the Oregon Senate, each the, the candidate, average spending by the candidate was $750,000. In the top 10 House races, the average spending was $684,000. That's to, you can, a House race can be won with about 11,000 votes. So that's about $60 
per vote, which makes Oregon legislative races the most expensive yeah. in the country, except for New Jersey. I'm sorry, did you say $68? 60, uh, some, yeah, somewhere or, in the range of 60 to $70 per vote. Wow, okay, I, 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 was, I was hoping you said 628, and I oh, no. misunderstood you, but I did understand no, you, 68. 68. Okay, that, that's for, for a, a job that pays maybe $24,000 a year? Uh, plus per diem. Oh. <laughs> One hundred and thirty dollars or so every day that the legislature's okay. in session. So, <laughs> okay. uh, no, that's not the um, legislators don't make make a lot of money by their salary. Mm -hmm. And in addition, we mentioned you know the disclosure part before. Oregon also doesn't have a very good disclosure system. We talked about Orstar and how that doesn't work too well. And even so, in order to determine who where the money comes from, you have to essentially you have to do. Research. It can take hours to do research on a single mm -hmm. candidate to determine where the money comes from. Um, so that's why we want the disclosure to be done in the political ads themselves. Um, Oregon used to have a law, had a law f since 1908, I believe it was enacted by initiative in 1908, that political ads had to identify their source. Um, didn't necessarily say the source of money, but at least the source of the ad. That's something. Um, but the Oregon legislature overwhelmingly repealed that in 2001, uh, and Governor Kitzhaber signed that bill. Of course. I testified against repealing it. I said we should have <laughs> political ads identify their sources, but mm -hmm. no, 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 no need that. Yeah. Well, well and of course, if, yeah, if he had run and had to reveal his true sources, Nike would be way up there. At 380. I, I think he gave. Uh, I think Phil Knight gave three right. three hundred eighty thousand dollars to. Right. Oh yeah. In in Oregon statewide races, particularly in governor races, it's not unusual for an individual or a corporation to contribute three or four hundred thousand dollars at a pop. Most of the time, it's uh, timber. It's still you think of Oregon as being you know a high tech state or something, but most of the large contributions are still from timber companies and timber company executives. Mm -hmm. With uh, with some others sprinkled in, but it's still mainly timber. Really, yeah. Um, so the Corporate Reform Coalition, which was a, it's a group of 75 national organizations, did a study in 2012 to determine what states have the best or worst systems for disclosing independent expenditures, and they also granted Oregon an F, while at the same time granting Washington an A. Sticking with our same low standards. Our same bottom of the barrel standards. That's right. So we. But this is let me just ask because. Every time I hear in a, in a town hall, and of course this is mostly in Portland, uh, a town hall, a, an elected uh, representative or senator talking, and if the question of money and politics comes up, they will universally say that they're opposed to it and they want to do something about it. But yet, we're still at F's. Well, the Oregon legislature has never adopted a law to limit political contributions, never in its entire history. It's repealed them four times hmm. when they've been adopted by initiative, but it's never adopted a law limiting, uh, limiting contributions. And so, hmm. okay. and also, if you're going to town halls in Portland, keep in mind that's part of the safe district area. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so these the Democrats uh, in the legislature in Portland basically don't have to run races in the general election, mm -hmm. and so they don't have to raise any money or spend any money. So it doesn't seem to be very important to them. The expensive races are those in the suburbs, uh, Washington County, Clackamas County, uh, the east, very eastern part of Multnomah County, uh, the, the suburban sort of areas around Eugene and, and Springfield, uh, a, couple of, a couple of seats up and down uh, the Willamette Valley, and the city of Bend. And those are the only competitive se seats mm -hmm. in Oregon in the, in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is take our Multnomah County measure statewide. So we have, we have the problem of the of the Oregon Supreme Court in 1997, ruling that the Oregon, co in their, in a decision that I characterize as Citizens United on steroids, um, which said that not only does the does freedom of speech protect expenditures, but it protects contributions. Um, and so here is a con Oregon constitutional amendment to eliminate that, and to say that this is the entire measure, by the way. Mm -hmm. Oregon law is consistent with the freedom of speech guarantee of the U.S. Constitution may regulate contributions and expenditures including transfers of money or resources with the purpose or effect of influencing the outcome of any election. So um, thanks to your efforts primarily and those of, of several others, uh, we collected the thousand, the 15, 1,600 signatures to start the ballot title process a few months ago. 
And we were supposed to get a ballot title uh, for this uh, a week ago, but instead this, our Oregon Secretary of State said, well, you can't collect signatures because this is more than one amendment. Which is absurd which is, because... Uh, this is a really simple, it's a single sentence, Dan. Right. <laughs> we had this, basically the same sentence plus another one in, in, the year, in 2006, which the, or, which the Secretary of State then approved as against, a one, against a more than one amendment challenge. The ACLU filed a lawsuit to keep us, from, keep us off the ballot back in 2006. And the ACLU, uh, however, lost in the Oregon Supreme Court on that. And this is, this is a subset of the measure mm -hmm. that in 2006 was shown to be not more than one amendment. So mm -hmm. it's totally, it's totally yeah. unjustified, so, and we'll be filing a lawsuit in a couple of days about okay, that. Great, yeah. So, so a, at this point, no signatures can be collected on this. Can't collect signatures because of the decision of the Oregon Secretary of State, Dennis Richardson. Okay. Right. We expected better treatment from the, uh, yes. from the Secretary of State right, than yeah. that. Um, and uh, so we will be filing suit and uh, asking for the courts to handle this in the so most rapid manner possible. He made, he made his decision, on, I presume, on the basis of the comments from an organization. Well, he says he made the decision on the basis of the recommendation of the Attorney General. Oh, okay. Uh, Ellen Rosenbaum. But um, under Oregon law, it's his decision to make. It's not the Attorney General's decision to make. And he made the decision, and so now he will be the defendant in the lawsuit. Okay, all right, yeah. yeah. So what I was trying to get back uh, from you was the name of the organization oh. that filed the comments yes, that was one, probably the basis of the decision. Well, one organization filed the comment saying, this is more than one amendment, you can't collect signatures. And that is, wasn't actually an organization, it was an individual, Ben Unger, who is the executive director of Our Oregon, which is a union-funded organization that many people think is, a, is an adjunct of the Democratic Party of Oregon. Mm -hmm. The state level Democratic Party of Oregon is, is definitely adamantly against campaign finance reform. In spite of the fact that if you go to those, those town hall meetings here in Portland where That's they're right. all Democrats, they will always tell you that they're in favor of campaign finance reform. That's right, but they don't, but they don't vote for it. I mean, I could give, give you many examples mm -hmm. in the legislature where there are Republicans voting for campaign finance reform and Democrats voting against it. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the next uh, little table just shows that what we're talking about doing here is not unusual. Uh, many states have contribution limits and have had them for decades. Some are, um, are as low as $200 in legislative races like Colorado or 250 for Connecticut or 170 for Montana. Hmm. So well, wow. um, not unusual at all. Even the states on the right there have limits far better than Oregon does. Um, the states that are, that are um, beacons of democracy, like you know, Idaho and South Dakota and, and West Virginia, mm -hmm. they all have limits, but Oregon doesn't. Mm -hmm. Oregon is, Oregon is, is the Wild West. Okay, yeah, right. And, and, and so if, if, um, if you're not successful in your suit to get this initiative petition on, on the ballot, mm -hmm. does that really mean then that Oregon will never have limits on campaign contributions? Well, um, not necessarily. The Oregon Supreme Court can change its mind. Of course, there's been complete turnover on the court since 1997, and we will have our Multnomah County initiative uh, will no doubt be challenged, and that will go to the Oregon Supreme Court, and they can change their mind. Okay. Just like the or U.S. Supreme Court changes its mind all the time. Okay. It changed its mind between 2006 and 2010 on independent okay. expenditures. Okay, and, and so if it changes its mind, that means then we could pass laws to, to limit campaign contributions and expenditures. Right. Okay, well that would, be, that would be simple. It would be. Yeah. Now, I mentioned the legislature doesn't do campaign finance reform. Here's the, there's one example of what the legislature is working on this year, and that is um, House Bill 2351. Now, if you look at the, at, the, at the published summary of that, it says, establish a civil penalty of up to 10% of campaign monies improperly converted to personal use in circumstances where conversion is accurately included in timely filed statements. So that sounds pretty good. 10%. It establishes a penalty. Mm -hmm. In fact, it changed the existing penalty, which is 100% oh. of, the of the unlawfully converted amount and reduces the penalty from 100% to 10%. 
So in fact, it does the it has the opposite effect of how it's portrayed. Right. Yeah. So that's not 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 much of a penalty, not much reason to uh, you know if you're going to make ninety percent of something, well, that's that's okay. That's right. It, it's kind of it like makes a, it worthwhile. Like a ten percent tax mm -hmm. on diverting campaign money to personal mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. So I testified against this bill in the House Rules Committee on March twenty first, but the Rules Committee approved it by a vote of nine to nothing anyway because then you know five Demo five Republicans, I mean five Democrats, four Republicans. And it went to the floor on August, April 27th. It was you know, ready to go on the floor, but on the same on that same day, the or the Willamette Week published an article about it, entitled and had a big picture of a pig there, that entitled Oregon House will vote today on a bill that allows nearly unlimited personal use of campaign funds. As a result of that, the bill was pulled off the off the floor and wasn't voted upon. Mm -hmm. But it's still in committee, and it could still and it could still come back. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's okay. what passes for campaign finance reform at the Oregon Legislature okay. is right. making it worse rather than better. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we have um, two minutes, a statement about what citizens of Oregon could do. What could an individual citizen do? Um, keep in touch with the with uh, Alliance for Democracy at the addresses indicated, and also the Oregon Progressive Party at info at prodparty.org. And um, collect signatures when that is available. Um, testify on bills at the Oregon Legislature. If you contact us, we will tell you how to do that. Um, the Oregon Legislature is busy um, messing with other supposed Oregon icons of progressivity and progressiveness, like the the bottle bill. They are now yeah. changing the bottle bill so that the so that bottles and cans don't have to be accurately labeled. So you don't know which bottles to take back for your tents and deposits. Right, yeah. So another story for another day. Thank you very much for being here, Dan. All right. All right. Great. All right. So we've been talking with Portland attorney Dan Meek. Dan is the legal advisor of the Oregon uh, Progressive Party. You can learn more about the Progressive Party at www.progparty. Dot org. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the program. I hope that you will have a progressive populist tomorrow. Bye.